Right, well hello again. We're coming close to the end of our series introducing uh, the main features of Python for experienced programmers. And by this point uh, you probably should have had uh, a fair degree of experience at programming because I'm introducing some features that don't exist in some languages but are heavily used in others. So let's get to it and go and look at our little examples. So I'm going to go back to cl using classes. So probably the easiest thing to do is to go back to the earlier point in uh, my example uh, where I introduced a, cli uh, a class and what we do here. So let me take that piece of code here and paste it in again at the end. And then I can talk more about it. So here we'd defined a class called Books and I introduced the double underline, some call them dunder methods, double underline methods or some built-in methods to tell Python how to do various functions. So this is how to uh, instantiate a class, how to create a, a class object of type book. And here is a type converter, how to convert something of type of the object book into a string so that we could print it. But actually there's a whole load of other things that we could do um, with, with these. And so we can redefine lots of built-in operations. So that's one example of type conversion. And actually we could put the other names of types in there. So if it was possible to convert a book to an integer, we could <coughs> do that, or a float, or a complex, or a boolean. We would just put the underlines in. Um, but also we can define operations. So if adding a book to a book meant something, we could put that in. So maybe I could put like a multiplication operator in and and I could say I don't know if we multiplied a book by two we could say the title had appended to it some information about the addition in brackets and now I've given a formatted string there so <clears throat> I've altered the title and I could return the thing itself. So perhaps I could do that. I could I could create the book. I could print it and then I could print the result of saying my book times two. Let's see what happens with that. So there we are. It's kind of made it the second edition. Um, that's an artificial example. Um, and what you could put in comparing a book, is a book equal to a book? Well, that's um, 
and, th and then you get to the point of what is the name of the thing that you add to the class. So you could end up looking in the manual and the manual then tells you the names for all uh, the built-in uh, methods that you need and actually in the manual there's so many of them um, so I not happen to know that comparison ones are higher up in the manual because I saw them earlier so here we are so it's EQ so if I wanted to define what it means to compare a book to a book so it's returning the boolean that you get by defining two things so self title is equal to other title and self.author is equal to the other. So if title and author are the same it uh, returns true otherwise false. Um, we could possibly uh, check that out um, just by comparing the book with itself. I've got that right. Oh, no, I haven't got it right. Yep, I was briefly using C. Dropped into C there for a second. And as you saw in the manual, there are a whole load of other built-ins. So there's all kinds of operations that, that you can add to a class. You can uh, document the relationships to dictionaries, to lists, their ordering, and, and uh, all kinds of other operations. One thing you can't do, though, uh, compared to other languages, say... There are a few other languages where you can define new operators. Unfortunately, you're stuck with the built-in set of Python operators and you can't add new symbols and give definitions for them for your new object. And also, you can't change the evaluation order. You can't make uh, adding take precedence over multiplying. You still have to have the same arithmetic ordering even if your objects are no longer arithmetic so you can't change a priority in, in Algol 68 you can do that and some other languages you can do that depending on what language you're coming from before you do that so no alternate symbols but there's a whole load of symbols in in the library so how can we summarize uh, so can define all existing operators for new object. There is no new symbols that can be added and uh, you need to look at the manual. Um, Another thing that we can do with classes is obviously inheritance, so, so who are used to classes and object orientation. Yes, Python has all that, but the examples start to get a bit longer, so, so I won't define a new class that inherits um, from books, uh, but it's fully... Oh, oh. It has inheritance. And basically, this is the point where you need to start really um, looking at the, the manual. Inheritance. So you've got inheritance and various other things. Other things that you need to look up. 
um, if you need it. So you need to read about using classes and namespaces and modules. So these are <coughs> various other things um, and packages. So how you start putting classes and all the operations <coughs> and creating packages, that's probably something uh, for you to research yourself in the manuals rather than me to show you simple examples here because I want to keep it short and snappy okay what else can we talk about okay so semicolons I've been avoiding them up to now but you notice that there has been no semicolons at the end of the lines we we don't do that in Python. The separation is by a new line and the block blocking is defined by indentation. But actually semicolons are defined. Um, so if we were to define an if statement, normally we'd put something on the other line. But you can put something here. And normally you'd put something on the other line, but you can use the semicolon, and semicolon makes a block. So two statements separated by a semicolon make a compound statement, um, and that's the it's equivalent to. Um, so I did this, what would happen? I get a syntax error because the semicolon makes this a compound statement and be underneath the if. So th that is expecting a new if statement. So it would expect it to look like that. And now we've got an indentation error. And it's thoroughly confused. And I need to remove the semicolons. To get it working again. So I don't get confused by the semicolons. However, I can print put another print after this one and get it to print something else. Okay, and I can run that, and as you can see, my system's um, being a bit sluggish today. Uh, but I can run that and Those two are now joined by the semicolon, so the semicolon's a separator. Um, so only experienced programmers who understand what they're doing and know the difference between a separator and a terminator. And usually you shouldn't do it. We should normally see no semicolons, certainly not a statement terminators in Python. Okay, so what else can uh, we add? in our set of things. Um, to add a few more things that you should probably look at in the manual. I said Python is dynamically typed and everything is a generic, but we can use T 
type hints. So at certain places you can say what type you're expecting to help the Python system do some static checking so that some checks can be done before runtime um, but normally uh, you wouldn't but particularly when you've got complicated objects with new classes that make some type. So for example I could have used some type hinting back here to say there's this addition I'd expect to be an int uh, somehow and for a second edition or something like that. So again that's an area where you need to read the documentation because it gets a bit complex. And multi-language programming. Let me just put that one in. There is a library called C types that comes with Python that's intended to interface with C and the C family of languages so that you can call operating system built-ins that are defined in the C language or libraries that are defined in C so that you can invoke them from Python. But it doesn't work very well in a portable manner. So the way it works on a Mac is actually different from the way it works on Windows and the way it works on Linux. And the way it works for a 32-bit system is different than a 64-bit system. So it's not easy for me to show a universal example. And uh, that's basically it. So I think all that we've touched on one topic that uh, perhaps I might need to talk about in a future episode is about writing portable Python because we've said there are differences. So there are ways of sticking to something that is more portable and I've tried to write code that's universally portable in my examples which is why I've left some things out. And, um, <coughs> and I probably need to talk now about where you download Python from for your particular system and uh, what platforms you can use. So right at the beginning I showed there's a wide variety of platforms and I probably need to give some introduction to downloading and installing Python. Um, and you can do it for most platforms. For example I've got Python working on my Android phone um, and you can do it on most computers, uh, phones, tablets, anything really. It's pretty universal in the core language. Okay, so we just a little more to cover and we more or less wrap things up. So I hope that was useful for you um, and have enjoyed the series. Thank you.